the character and drama with which Shirley has just read our gospel from afar is so brilliant and so extraordinary, and I'm sure we will have her expression of those shocking words from this terrible master ringing in our ears. I would like to try something this morning. I would like us to take a breath together as this time of worship is just beginning, as we anticipate the Eucharist, and to do something together, which is very simple. Some of you may have done this before. For some of you, this may be new. And I promise you, it is not embarrassing, and you do not have to get up and move around. It's very simple. There will be no talking to your neighbor. Do not worry. I would like you to have your hands like this, whatever is comfortable for you, maybe about shoulder width apart, but no further. You don't have to like be like Daniel at the altar, just kind of keep them here. And I would like you to pay attention to your hands, not only how they look, but also how they feel and to breathe slowly, to slow your breath while you do so. Notice the lines on your hands. Imagine what they have touched, the gestures of tenderness given and received. You may notice a bit of a tingle in your fingers, in your palms. Now I'd like you to turn your attention to the space in between. Keep your breath slow and keep your eyes soft. Bring your heart into this process. I would like you to slowly and gently bring your hands towards each other as though you are embracing the air between your hands. And as you bring your hands together, fingertips to fingertips, palm to palm. Notice that sensation, the feeling of fingers together. Be kind and tender with your body, hand to hand. In this gentle stillness, offer a moment of thanks that in God and with one another, we belong. Through that belonging, we can build peace. And you can bring your hands apart. If you like, keep the rhythm of your breathing If that experience has been restful for you, then cherish that rest and share it with others. A few weeks ago, a few days after the war between Israel and Palestine, and Palestine began, ravaging and devastating such a febrile part of our anguished, of our anguished world, a group of people gathered in this church, over 150 of them from many Christian denominations, Quakers, Methodists, the URC, Anglicans, many more. We gathered together with Christian Aid and many organizations, and we prayed for peace. 
in each prayer section through the service, linked to a story with one person's experience among the many, we repeated together a refrain. It's a prayer as well as an observation from Mother Teresa of Kolkata. And she said, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to one another. That is the baseline. It is the first step in noticing, perhaps in a new way, the reality of being made in the image of God and that we are all in this together. If we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Today in our church, this building and this place, the community and the church throughout the world and in the Church of England, there are so many parts and so many hearts where there is violence and chaos. And there is also an immense amount of hope and courage and new things springing up all over the place. There is here also, as ever at St. James's, dare I say it, a lot going on. Here is how these layers are working together today across the liturgy, across particular moments in time, culturally in community as well as in church. There are a few different things to notice. And they all have something deep in common, which is in common in our readings today too. Belonging. Today is Safeguarding Sunday in the Church of England. This is about the capacity to look after and look out for one another, to cultivate spaces of trust and courage, to be able to recognize at any given time who is particularly vulnerable in a situation and why, knowing that there are ways to help, and also knowing that sometimes the vulnerable person in that situation might be ourselves. It's something that we share in community. It's part of the open-handed love that we can offer in this place because that's what Christ does first. Here's another thing. General Synod, the Church of England's governing group of clergy and lay people from across the nation, have agreed by a very tiny margin to allow a process from living in love and faith to move forward. This has to do with prayers so that queer couples may be blessed in their relationships in church. God already blesses these relationships. God already is doing that. That work is done. They are already beloveds loved and loving in God's eyes and in God's being as God's gifts of life in them. The Church of England so far has held back from blessing what is already blessed, blessing what's already true. So maybe this new little move, one moment, one conversation at a time, can align our church with God's radical love and wisdom and truth. Let's see what happens, and let's bear witness to this together. Here's the next one. This past week has been Interfaith Week. As you'll have seen in the newsletter, we've prayed for people of all faiths each day here in church and we've celebrated by inviting the Muslim artist Anusha Zia to display her painting in the side chapel. If you've not seen it, please take a look at it after the, surface, after the service. This is her first time working with a place of worship. It's been an honor to welcome her and her friends to the Sanctuary Eucharist on Tuesday and at various points across the past few days. 
We got to know one another through my previous role at the National Gallery, when one of the things I was doing together with many colleagues was building an interfaith community, people in the arts and people in and around places of worship who wanted to have conversations about trust building and peace building together through visual art. I like her work because it teaches us something about shared symbols. And praying with Anushe on Tuesday, offering services in the side chapel every day with this temporary altarpiece in place has been a unique gift. She made the painting using pomegranate pigment. It's not paint exactly, it's ground up pomegranate fragments. It's the fruit itself. The pomegranate is a deeply resonant symbol for Jewish, Muslim, and Christian people. It's a symbol of resurrection, the fruit of God's love and justice for eternity. Anushe's work responds directly to the pomegranates that you can find, and if you've not seen them before, this is another task, another pleasure for you after the service. The pomegranates you can find in Grinling Gibbon's 17th century Reredos, filled with fruit, flowers, vegetables, seashells, with that beautiful image of Jesus as a mother pelican feeding her chicks, the sacrifice of God's love up at the top. The pomegranate is in there. So the high altar and the side chapel at St. James's right now are united in symbolism, resurrection belonging symbolism with all those seeds clustered and nested together because of the mutual bonds of faith between friends at the communal and the personal level. Here is another layer. These past few days, it has been Transgender Awareness Week and tomorrow, is a day of mourning because it's transgen a transgender day of remembrance. I often think of these span of days celebrating, remembering, and honoring trans people in November as a vital echo of all saints and all souls days earlier in our Christian year. We give thanks for the whole company of heaven, the community we know are present, in all their glory, together with God and the angels, trans, non-binary, genderqueer folks among them all. It is a time to vow to safeguard together the beloved sacred lives of all trans people in a world where too often that does not happen. Here is another layer. We have just entered Disability History Month, which runs from mid-November until mid-December. In this month, there is a particular determination to resolve to fight against ableism in all its forms. And the theme for this month's Disability History Month, which is marked every year, is children and young people. So it's a time to be able to focus on that too. To seek justice is always about expanding belonging, defeating prejudice by listening, learning, and acting. As Amy Kenny, who uses a wheelchair, writes in her book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request, great title, which we will read together next Monday online. Whenever she goes for medical treatment, she sings. She explains that she sings in her head because she doesn't want to distract the doctors while they press a needle into her spine. And she sings the same song every time. It's Destiny's Child. It's Survivor. That's great, because some of you are like, I have it in my head now, this amazing 2001 hit. Thank you, Beyonce, what a gorgeous queen you are. And some people are like, I've never heard this song, I don't know what you're talking about. And I love that diversity at St. James's. It's one of my favorite things about being with you in community. Mariama is not here, but Beyonce is. <laughs> and if she doesn't watch this later, I will let her know. 
And one of the lines from this song that she sings and that she mentions in the book is, you thought that I'd be helpless without you, but I'm smarter. The song powerfully insists that justice is possible in every moment and that life is bigger and better and more than mere survival. If one person is not free, then no one is free. Not yet. With love and justice at the center of our Christian God-breathed world, freedom is possible. But what might it look like and feel like? And that is worth wondering about as well as acting upon. In our reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians, we are reminded at the end of the passage to encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. I love that affirmation. It's not just please do it, but it's also from the writer, and I recognize that you're doing it, and so please keep going. Because it's worth it. Without community building, we are lost. Without God's grace to transform chaos into steady, steadfast peace within, love uniting us all, we can't move forward. Some of you perhaps may be wondering whether or not I am going eventually to get to today's gospel because today's gospel is seriously hardcore and I'd better do it, right? <laughs> I promise you that this hasn't been some like mega distraction effort where I was trying to just convince you that I wasn't going to be doing it. I'm going to do it now. <laughs> and brace yourselves, right? Because today's gospel is painful. It's one I hear and read with a wince. When it starts with the man who begins that journey with a negotiation about distributing his property before he heads out of town for a while, I always think, oh no. I know what's coming. He distributes his wealth unevenly. He rewards what appears to be capitalist, greedy investment in order to make himself more wealthy. His servants don't get to keep anything. And he punishes, rather than compassionately attends, to the shame and fear of the one who he only gave one talent to anyway. This parable is full of potential harm. Much harm and damage has been done by reading it with that punishment in the spotlight. No one flourishes in a culture of fear. Not in a church, not in a job, not in a nation. It's not what we're built for. No one can do it. Work under the pressure of an abusive, oppressive authority may be productive on the surface. A lot of people do work that way and produce extraordinary things. But the human cost is cruel. The master in this story is not, I promise you, God. Not God as enraged or manipulative. The master is not the church. God's people are not subject to this cruelty through God. If you have ever heard or read this parable, including listening to it this morning, thinking, God is terrifying, I am the one who buried my talent in the ground, and I am the one heading for outer darkness, I would love it if you could let that go. Hopefully, there are also plenty of people in this building who've never heard it that way and have just been like, gosh, what an awful man, and either gone into it deeply in a different way or gone past it and thought, I don't know what that was about, and maybe I want to learn and question, but that isn't what I recognize you might be saying in your heart about the God I love and the Jesus I know. Jesus tells the story a few days before he dies, and it's part of a series of parables in that section of Matthew. It contains brutal words about outer darkness and weeping and teeth grinding. The New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine observes that Matthew uses this outer darkness phrase more than any other gospel writer. He seems to be strangely fond of it. She writes that the parable is a warning and it provokes us, but as she puts it, the view of the divine as one approving of eternal torture is not a view I hold. She goes on to say, is this threatening? Yes. Rhetorical overkill? 
no question. A prediction of what to expect as part of a final judgment? I doubt it. She points out that people may want a hell because they cannot find justice in this world. Others may think this world is hell enough. Hell, in so many ways, is a fantasy that's used to oppress people, concocted by people against one another. That fantasy need not have a place in this parable. If we believe that God is merciful and that God's abundance is real, then there must be something else happening here. Perhaps it's a story that works against the tendency to individualism and assumptions about God. If the baseline assumption about God is that God condemns, then fear will lead us to bury the gift that we have out of terror. If we do not turn towards each other and notice that each of the people act individually rather than sharing what they have in common and creating something new. If we do not turn towards each other, then whatever we made will be less than what we could have done together. Wealth is, in our world, distributed often without regard to equity, and it is unjust. If it is shared in common, communities and the planet can be transformed. If these three people had come together, what condemnation might there have been? We don't know. And what would the one with double their resources think of the one who has been rejected? What might it be like for that person to watch another being shoved out and cast away? We don't know. At the end, in all that weeping, I think it's important to notice that these phrases are not said by Jesus. They're said by this character that Jesus has invented. And he remains cruel to the end, that character, because the oppressor cajoles the productive capitalistic people with the five and the two, just as oppressed as anyone else, no matter how much they produce, to participate in the shamed outcast's rejection. So I'd like us to try this experiment together with this parable. What if those three people came together and said no to this cruel, oppressive master? What if this is a call to action to resist cruelty, rise up, and come together and say, no, we will not put up with your oppression anymore. We will go out into that outer darkness and we will sit there together if we have to, but ultimately, that darkness has no power over us because as we read in the first letter to the Thessalonians, we are first of all because of God, made in the image of God, children of light. If no one person is free, then none of us are free. We can, with God's help, as our prayer today and our collect teaches us, be stirred from apathy and revived in new hope. Do not let that outer darkness have the last word. Amen.